Hi, everybody, and welcome to lecture one. Uh, this lecture, we have kind of a lot to, to work through, um, so it's going to be maybe a little bit of a longer lecture than it typically will be after this. And the reason for that is we're going to sort of talk about some fundamental premises for the course. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about cultural anthropology in general. Um, and then I also want to move through the readings and some other sort of background information so you understand um, sort of where anthropologists are in the study of gender sexuality and the body. So a lot of what this lecture will do is to set us up for the things we're going to be discussing for the rest of the semester, giving you both um, some knowledge about sort of the lay of the land in this area of anthropology and also giving you some theoretical tools that I'm hoping you can use um, as we start talking about other topics in the course. Okay, so bear with me. Um, there are quite a number of things we're going to discuss, um, but hopefully we'll, um, we'll we'll get it in, get it all in in this lecture, and, and it will be useful to you. Okay, um, so I titled the lecture a really uh, sort of boring, basic title: "The Anthropology of Gender, Sexuality, and the Body," because again, I want this to be sort of um, the lecture that orients you to the approach of the course to these subjects. So here's what we're going to do. This is sort of our agenda down here at the bottom of the slide. I want to start with a brief introduction to the field of cultural anthropology. Um, as I think you know, this course is what at Northeastern is called an ELEX course. And what that means is that, you know, we are um, working at the 300 level, so a more advanced undergraduate course. But because it's an ELEX, there is no um, requirement for you to have taken anthropology before, okay? Part of the idea with these courses that is that students uh, from really any major um, can engage in 300 level anthropology. Um, so because of that, I want to spend a little bit of time on talking about anthropology, understanding that you um, may come at this from a, a different discipline, from a different major. After we do that, I do want to um, talk about the material that you read. Um, I had you read four review articles, um, and those provide, I think, a really good overview of this area of the anthropology of gender, sexuality, and the body. Um, as I assume you've um, seen in doing that reading, review articles are a very particular kind of publication. Uh, so sort of as the name implies, uh, each of those authors is doing a sort of step back to review what is going on in anthropology around these subjects and what sort of um, the key areas are that anthropologists have addressed in recent times, right? Um, so doing sort of um, an overview for other anthropologists typically so that folks can kind of catch up and inform themselves about what, what have been the areas of, of focus for anthropologists on these subjects. So all of those are review articles. Um, it gives them a certain sort of approach and feel, right? There's a lot of um, sort of summarizing and citing of, of many anthropologists' work. So, you know, some of the things we'll read later, they won't sound like that. They'll be more focused on the particular subject or the particular study of one anthropologist. So the reason to have you read review articles right away is, again, to sort of give you some grounding and situate you in these fields so you get sort of a more sweeping view of the kinds of things that are important to think about. So we'll talk about those. And then I do want to, as I said, sort of tie some things together um, and uh, end with some key takeaways or theoretical tools that I'm hoping you'll be able to make use of as we move forward in the course. So that, those are the three main things we're going to do. So let's get to it. Okay, let's start with anthropology. Um, so this is a cultural anthropology course. Um, as you may know, cultural anthropology is just one of four of what we call subfields within anthropology. So effectively, anthropology, the overall discipline, has four branches, and cultural anthropology is one of them. Taken all together, anthropology across those four subfields is, as I'm summarizing it here, the study of what it means to be human across space and over time. That's a super succinct a description or a definition of anthropology, I think it'll serve us fine for now, right? Um, anthropologists are interested in what it means to be human, right? What is or how can we talk about the human experience? Um, and the re one of the reasons that um, anthropology is subdivided into those four, sub four subfields is because obviously that's an incredibly vast 
field of study, right? What it means to be human um, is, um, is massive. So the four subfields of anthropology take that question or that topic on from different complementary um, perspectives, right? And the idea is that when you bring those four subfields together, you have a sort of holistic view of what it means to be human, okay? So those four subfields, as as depicted here, right under the un, the the umbrella of anthropology, um, archaeology, uh, biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology, and cultural anthropology, which is what this course is grounded in. Okay, so let me just really quickly run through them. We'll spend most of our time talking about cultural anthropology because that's what's important to us for this course. So biological anthropology is, um, in fact, a STEM field, right? It's a natural science. Um, biological anthropologists are looking at things like human evolution, right, or the evolutionary record leading to modern humans, um, as well as human biological variation in the present. Um, so they're really interested in sort of um, humans' physical bodies um, and how they've evolved and changed and vary um, over time and in the present. Archaeology um, is more similar to cultural anthropology in that it is interested in human societies, right? So it's interested in human social life more than human biology, but archaeologists look at those human societies in the past. Uh, so as, again, you may know, archaeologists, the way that they learn about societies is by uncovering the materials left behind by those, those societies through excavation. Um, so they're not able to actually engage with those people from the past, but they are able to look at the stuff left behind um, and using various kinds of methods, um, make some analyses of what life was like in previous societies. Uh, linguistic anthropology, which is um, sort of overlapping with and really kind of a sister discipline to the field that's called linguistics, um, is based on language, right? So linguistic anthropologists are really focused on language and cultural context. Um, and then finally, last but not least, is cultural anthropology. And um, what we study is contemporary human social life. So how people live in groups, um, what kinds of things they think and do in those groups, um, and what the experience of being human um, really is all about. Um, so that is what we're interested in both documenting and theorizing, is contemporary human social life. The graphic also includes a, um, applied anthropology down at the bottom. Um, some folks refer to or talk about applied anthropology as sort of the fifth subfield, but as this graphic, I think, is trying to depict, it's really more like, it's not a separate subfield in the sense of like it's separate topics from the others. It's more like um, um, one way that anthropologists from any subfield may um, make use of their findings, right? So all of these fields participate in sort of academic research, right? Um, so research for the sake of extending knowledge in all of these areas. And then there are also all kinds of applications that come that can come out of them. So um, some anthropologists are more involved in the applied part, right? So um, for example, archeologists, interested in applied anthropology or in applying their findings might be um, interested or working in cultural resource management, right? Um, anth uh, cultural anthropologists interested in application might take their findings um, and offer ideas about, uh, you know, public health programs, say, based on what they find. Um, so there are all kinds of ways to apply, um, as well as all kinds of ways to make use of those findings in the, um, uh, contributing to scholarly knowledge on these subjects. Okay, so that's sort of the basics of anthropology and where cultural anthropology is located within that broader field. So then let's zoom in a little bit on cultural anthropology. Again, as I said in the last slide, the study of contemporary human social life. So I wanna talk about a few of the key um, characteristics and components of this field of cultural anthropology. Cultural anthropology is a qualitative social science, right? So let me um, talk a little bit about what the different parts of that phrase mean. Um, so it's a social science, which distinguishes it, for example, from the sciences that fall into the STEM category, right? So as a social science, we're not using the scientific method, right? We're not typically working in labs to conduct experiments. 
Um, but we are interested in empiric empirically um, studying how people do things, collecting data, analyzing it, um, and making some um, arguments, suggestions, etc., about what we think is going on there. Um, it's qualitative, which distinguishes it from more quantitative social science. Um, quantitative social science would be something like um, some sociologists and most economists, for example, use statistics to try to analyze what's going on in human society. Um, contrary to that, cultural anthropologists use primarily qualitative approaches. What that means is instead of crunching the numbers, right, in terms of what we're trying, how we're trying to make sense of human behavior, we are using um, narrative and textual sources of information, and we are using a more sort of interpretive analytical approach. So, for example, one of the key methods, research methods, that cultural anthropologists employ is doing interviews, right? So we do often unstructured, open-ended interviews. We collect people's narratives, comments, their stories, um, and then we look for patterns and themes that emerge from across the many, many stories we hear from lots of different people in a particular social world. And that is sort of the basis for us um, sort of thinking about and ultimately um, publishing or talking publicly about um, what we think is happening in a particular place. Okay, so it's qualitative. It's focused on words more than numbers is one way to think about it. Um, and it's really um, much more about engaging with people and trying to understand um, what they have to tell us about their lived experiences. Okay. To, to get at that information, cultural anthropologists engage in a form of research that's often called fieldwork, which entails actually um, going to a social community that we're interested in learning about and sort of embedding ourselves there, right? So the typical research for cultural anthropologists um, is long-term fieldwork, where we go to the cultural spaces we want to learn about as opposed to, for example, you know, inviting people into a lab, right, to be interviewed or something like that. Um, so, in fact, being um, in the social space that we want to um, address is a significant part of how cultural anthropologists do their work, and we call that field work. In the course of that field work, then, we're employing those sort of research methods that I've started to mention, right, like interviewing, observing, those kinds of things. We'll talk more about the research methods that cultural anthropologists use a little bit later into the semester. Uh, for example, you all are going to be doing some interviewing as part of one of your assignments, so we, we will get into more about that. Um, the product that cultural anthropologists um, uh, produce at the end of all that is called ethnography. So ethnography is both sort of an approach to doing research and a, an approach to presenting the findings from your research. So many of the things you will be reading for this course are ethnographies, right? That is, they are um, pieces of writing in which anthropologists both sort of describe the cultural world that they've been um, visiting or being a part of for some time. Um, and again, kind of look for themes and patterns and try to provide as holistic and detailed uh, of a sort of... Um, um, picture of what's going on in that place as possible. So that's ethnography and ethnographic writing, right? The, the, the approach to both doing that research and the kinds of books and articles and, and things that are yielded by that research is also a really important part of what cultural anthropology is. And it also, as we'll talk about in a little bit, is um, an uh, important part of the anthropology, specifically of gender, sexuality, and the body. Okay. So fieldwork, particular approaches to fieldwork and writing, in this case, ethnography, also hallmarks of cultural anthropology. All right. Um, I think one of the most important things that cultural anthropologists do is what I'm calling here unpacking taken for granted categories and concepts. Um, and you'll see that again and again throughout the course. Um, so in other words, taking um, categories of human experience and practice that may be assumed to be straightforward or universal or just something that is, um, and instead looking for all the ways that they are specific, 
and um, uh, distinctive to particular cultural or historical moments, um, and really kind of talking about where they come from and how they operate. Right? So one of the ways that cultural anthropologists unpack categories and concepts is by providing that cultural and historical context. That is really demonstrating how variable certain things are, right? You know, I, I added this little kind of goofy um, graphic of food at the top just as a shorthand for all the different uh, sort of cuisines and foodways that we talk that that we um, encounter across um, across cultures, um, and that's just one example of ways in which cultural variability becomes um, not just something that, you know, we can sort of note in passing, but something that becomes a basis for understanding both what makes humans um, similar to each other, what we all have in common, what our shared humanity is, and also all the things that we do in quite different ways, in different places and at different times. So um, showing that cross-cultural variability is uh, one of the ways that anthropologists really can demonstrate that some stuff that we take for granted is really just the particular culturally accepted way of doing things in a particular place, right? All of us tend to assume that how we grew up doing stuff is sort of natural in some way, or it just makes sense, or it's just the way things are done. Um, anthropologists really um, push us to become more self-aware about that and understand that what feels normal or natural to any one of us is simply what is part of our own cultural worldview, right? Something that feels radically different is just as normal and natural to the folks who practice that, right? So that applies to things like food and what you think is delicious or disgusting, as well as lots of different other elements of, of everyday cultural life. Um, so the other way I think that um, this issue of unpacking taken for granted um, categories is important in cultural anthropology is also in providing um, some theories that can cut across all those cultural, cult culturally variable examples and allow us some, again, tools or um, frameworks for thinking about the human experience across space and time, right? So I guess what I'm saying in this item is that anthropologists are interested both in the specificity and variability and differences across cultures and in finding the things that are the universals or the constants, the things that tie us all together. And one of the ways we do that is creating or um, producing theory that um, can give us that sort of um, that framework or that big idea to test those things across different spaces. Um, so the thing I'll sort of um, go to next, and then I'm going to break it down a bit more, is the probably most important concept in the field of cultural anthropology is culture, right, as the name suggests. Um, and the culture concept is um, often not that straightforward, even for cultural anthropologists. Um, in other words, it's something that's been much debated over the history of the discipline, um, and it's not always something that is easily captured in a one sentence definition. Um, although I'm going to try here, right? So the sort of working definition I'm going to give you for culture is everything people do feel, think, and say in the context of a particular social world, right? Um, and again, I'm going to break it down a bit more in, in a second. But as you can see, that's a very sort of encompassing, holistic um, concept, right? Um, it becomes even more complex when I add that those things that people do feel, think, and say are always a moving target, right? So in other words, culture in any place at any time is patterned, right? We can look and see some regularity and say how people do things or what people eat in a particular world. But it's also always changing, right, over historical time. Um, and it both is something that we receive and sort of inherit from the generation before us, right? It's um, it's something that influences each of us in terms of how we think about and act in the world. But it's also something that reflects current change, right? So in other words, you are um, um, doing things that are part of the cultural world you were born into, and you are also part of crafting the next iteration of those cultural practices, right? So it's always a work in progress, and all of us are, to some extent, participates participants in creating that culture. 
Okay, so um, let's again dive in a little bit more to culture. Um, and I'm spending extra time on this because it's such an important theoretical tool for cultural anthropology, and it's something that will, um, again, serve you well across all the different things we've talked about this semester. Okay, so if, as I just suggested, culture is everything people do feel, think, and say in the context of a particular social world, then, um, you know, what does that mean in practice? Um, so as I started to allude to, it means that you are both the um, bearer of culture that you have um, been had handed down to you by your parents and your grandparents and the people before them, and you are one of the creators of culture in this moment and moving forward, right? So to be human, according to Reich, is to be simultaneously the recipient recipient of millions of years of culture and to be active as a creator of, a creator of culture, right? Likewise, cultural knowledge is not a set of rules, but a set of principles for map making and navigation. In other words, there are sort of um, um, ways in which culture hands you a, a lens for seeing the world in certain ways and for acting in the world, but it's not rigid and it's not um, completely limiting, right? In other words, we're not all walking around like cultural robots doing exactly what some cultural rule book has told us to do, right? It's more of a set of principles that we can then improvise on and or we can reject and change, right? So there's both ways in which culture informs our behavior and ways in which we take culture sort of by the horns um, and do new things with it all the time. To get a little bit more specific, here are some of the key characteristics of culture. Culture's learned, right? You are not born having some kind of um, instinct to act in a culturally appropriate way in your home or in your neighborhood or in your nation or in your society. Everything you know as an enculturated being, you learn from somebody else. Typically, we learn a lot of that from the people we grow up around. So parents, family members, neighbors, schools, etc. right? Um, but it's important to understand that the way that humans do things is a product of cultural learning in a way that makes us considerably different than other kinds of animals, right? Um, animals have certain kinds of instincts for behavior, right? We, and th there's lots of debate about whether some animals have culture, um, particularly um, primates, like, say, chimpanzees, who learn things and pass information on to um, other generations sometimes, which is a whole other debate, an interesting debate, one we're not going to have in this class, because that is in biological anthropology. But, um, but yeah, you weren't, you weren't born knowing... Um, any of this, right? Anything from your language abilities to um, how to greet someone to how to carry yourself in a crowd, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is learned. Culture shared, right? You are not a culture of one. By definition, what we're talking about when we talk about culture is something that is social in nature. Um, and is something that in ways ties together and provides sort of um, shared communication um, across a broad group of people. On the other hand, uh, culture is constantly changing, right? All kinds of expectations and cultural uh, rules um, that even were in place in a society like the United States a couple of decades ago are, are no longer the case and have changed significantly, right? Um, the example on the screen about sort of changes in, in definitions of marriage is a big one, right? Marriage is one of those cultural institutions that we find the world over. Um, what we also find is that the forms that marriage takes are very different across cultural spaces. And again, that they're always changing. So they are also changing they're, they're different across space, and they're also changing across time. So within the same society, you find those definitions and practices changing. Um, on the other hand, uh, culture includes universals. So staying with this idea of um, marriage being a sort, a sort of cultural universal, there are some places in the world where marriage is not 
uh, part of what people do, right? But the vast majority, even in those spaces, there's often some kind of um, recognition of partnerships, right, that play important roles in social and biological reproduction. But, um, but the vast majority of societies have um, something we would recognize as marriage. So that makes it kind of a universal. Again, this is going to that idea that one of the things anthropologists are interested in is those things that kind of tie us all together, meaning all human beings on the planet. Um, however, again, those universals are universal or um, the same thing at the broadest level, right? So the particulars are very different in different places and times, right? Um, so this is... Um, uh, a picture of a man with his several wives and all of their children, right? So marriages that involve more than two partners, right, or, or in which one person can have more than one spouse is one of those variations on this broader um, universal or quasi-universal institution of marriage. Culture is also integrated. What I mean by that is even as we will often talk about different areas of human social life, like politics versus economics versus gender and sexuality versus art. The fact is, in actual practice, in our day to day, all of those things are integrated. They're tied together. They're part of our lived experience. We don't have um, those different parts of human life sort of um, compartmentalized off from one another, right? We don't do our economics on Tuesday and our politics on Wednesday. It's all kind of mushed together, right? So I put this slide, which I think it, you may have seen these posters um, in recent years. They're often used in various political contexts. Um, they're created by an artist named Shepard Ferry, and I think they're a good example of how politics and art, for example, are often um, integrated with one another. You can't really draw the line between where one ends and when the other begins. Um, so I think it's important for us to remember that, that the way we actually live our lives is integrated, even as you will find um, a, a field like cultural anthropology divided up into categories, right? Like the anthropology of gender and sexuality versus political anthropology versus economic anthropology, right? We need to remember that those that's a device for studying those things that doesn't reflect how those things actually um uh, operate in in the real world, in our lives, right? In our real lives, those are all integrated with one another. Culture is also symbolic, which means that um, there's lots of things that people do that are using symbols to stand for other things. That, that, that that's an important part of our, particularly our communication. Language itself is probably the most obvious example of how culture is symbolic, right? Um, language is basically a system of symbols where certain sounds or when we write language letters um, are symbols for something else. They stand for something else. They carry meaning that we have arbitrarily assigned those sounds and letters to carry. So, for example, in this image, um, a flag is a, another good example of a symbol, right? Um, flags encompass all kinds of meanings about nation states, about um, concepts of patriotism, about government, and they're often used both as something that can bring people together and something that can divide people, right? So it's a potent sort of um, tool for conveying meaning. Um, and again, that use of symbols and the, the presence of symbolic aspects is another hallmark of what culture is and how culture operates. Culture creates categories. Um, one of the things we'll talk about a lot in this course is the categories that have been constructed, particularly around gender, sexuality, and the body, and you know what, what those categories do, where they came from and what they do. Right. And what it means to try to push against or unpack or challenge those categories. Um, culture has a tendency to create categories for better or for worse. Um, often um, one of the things that that cultural principles do in any particular space is make distinctions between this versus that. Right. Um, and all of those distinctions are different or they're specific to to different cultures 
Um, one example we could look at in the U.S. and other societies um, is the use of categories around um, the identities uh, associated with race and ethnicity, right? So what I have on the screen here is um, a census form, right? And I don't know if you followed the evolution of the census form over the last several iterations, um, but the questions about race and ethnicity have been on the census form almost from the very beginning of the form, right, in the 19th century. Um, but those, the nature of those questions has shifted as people's understandings of what race and ethnicity are and of how to define different races and, and ethnicities has changed. Um, so, for example, it used to be that people filling out the census form had to choose one of these race categories. Now people can mark more than one category and there's more of a sense of making a distinction between race and ethnicity, right? And there's also a lot more and some different um, options on these lists. So all of that is just to say that a culture creates categories. And again, as mentioned earlier, even those categories are constantly shifting, right? So culture is fluid. Um, and we see that in things like census forms. Cultures also use creatively, right? This kind of goes with the idea that um, culture is not set in stone. It's something that shifts over time. Um, and one of those reasons that, is that people um, People play around with that, right? People take certain things and use them in different ways. They make connections, they improvise, etc. right? Um, this is an image of people engaging in capoeira, which is um, an art form in Brazil that is sort of a combination of dance and martial arts um, and also speaks to the history of the place, uh, particularly um, as a place where many people of African descent um, who were enslaved during the transatlantic slave trade um, and brought to South America. Um, and these art forms reflect some of that deep history. And it's also people sort of reimagining um, how to combine these different elements and those historical memories in a vibrant contemporary art form. Um, so again, this is another example of culture being used creatively. Culture is partly unconscious. So um, in addition to all those things I've said, right, about, um, you know, the ways we engage with culture, how we change culture, all of that, um, the interesting thing is that there's also lots of it that we're just not even aware we're doing, right? Um, so the um, example on the screen is about greeting behaviors um, and things like how far away you stand from someone when you talk to them. These are often the kinds of elements of culture that are at least partly unconscious. You often don't recognize you're doing one of them until you're around somebody who's doing it differently, right? If you've ever traveled to a different part of the world where people either stand farther apart or closer together, you may have found yourself feeling like either like, oh my God, nobody likes me, or why is this person like so close, right? Um, likewise, things like eye contact. Um, in some places, it's the practice to not look somebody in the eye when you just run, you know, when you pass a stranger on the street. In other places, it is absolutely the standard to stare at someone or what feels like staring, right, to often to people from the U.S. So all of those little things are unconscious. We don't know we're doing them, but they are all still very much a part of culture. Okay, so in my little sort of mini um, sprint through key concepts in cultural anthropology, I want to end on um, a couple of related key, other key concepts that I think we'll, we'll want to be able to bear forward as we go through the course. So cultural relativism is another key principle of cultural anthropology. And cultural relativism holds that if you want to understand a cultural practice that is different than how you grew up with or that you're not familiar with, the very first thing that's necessary is to suspend your own worldview to put aside all the assumptions that you bring to the table as far as what you would do in your own cultural sort of world or how you were brought up, the things that feel natural, all those things that you take for granted and do unconsciously, set that aside so you can try to understand an unfamiliar cultural practice um, from the sort of insider point of view, right? How the people doing that thing, 
understand it themselves. So not through the lens of your own cultural expectations, but from how people understand them in, in their own right. So this is the opposite of another concept, which is ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is, as it kind of, you can kind of see what the word means by how it's constructed, is assuming that your own cultural framework is the center, right? Is the most obvious, the most natural, the sort of the best. Um, and that's something that cultural anthropologists work against, right? So one of the things that I think will be really important as we continue to read all the different kinds of ethnographic examples you're going to see in this course is to maintain that stance of cultural relativism, right? So in other words, you'll be reading about practices in other parts of the world that are really different from what you've experienced in your own life or what the norm is in your own society, in your own community. Um, so I encourage you to engage in cultural relativism, that is to suspend your own um, set of ideas about how things should be done and instead try to understand the sort of internal cultural logic for how people in that place do things, okay? Now, I want to make another distinction, which is what I'm encouraging you to do, which is to be a cultural relativist, um, does not mean that I'm encouraging you to embrace what I'm going to call moral relativism, right? And cultural anthropologists, for the most part, are not moral relativists, right? So in other words, saying that it's important in order to understand an unfamiliar cultural world or an unfamiliar cultural practice, that it's important to suspend your own judgment, right? To understand it. Um, it does not mean that we can't also have ideas about um, what is um, good and bad for people in the world, right? So in other words, most cultural anthropologists would both embrace cultural relativism and embrace the idea of certain universal human rights that should be in place everywhere, right? Um, so something, a practice can be um, culturally acceptable that in fact is bad for people, right? Um, so I think it's important for us to keep both things in mind, right? Um, being committed to the idea that people's um, lives should be as much as possible free from suffering, free from hunger, free from being exposed to violence, that people should have access to healthcare, for example, right? We can embrace all of those ideas and still be cultural relativists. Um, and understand that the world is a complicated place and that people do different things um, and that the way we do things is not necessarily the only way and certainly not necessarily the best way, right? So I want to encourage you to sort of adopt both of those sort of principles as you move through the materials um, and they'll help you think broadly and open-mindedly about the variation of things you're going to, you're going to learn about in the course. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let's move to some discussion of the more specific themes of the course, now that I've given you this sort of primer on cultural anthropology, the culture concept, etc. Um, the course is called The Anthropology of Gender, Sexuality, and the Body, and I wanted to start with some real sort of baseline stuff, and then we'll start talking about the review articles that you read and the, the more specific issues that they tease out. So... Um, uh, a few things, right? There's a lot to talk about, but I'm going to try to um, summarize some some key points, and we'll we'll unfold it all as we as we work through different parts of the course. But, um, you know, a lot of what anthropology of gender, sexuality, and the body is doing is something I mentioned in one of the previous slides, which is sort of unpacking taken for granted categories really, and questioning categories. Some of those categories are really entrenched. Um, and are assumed to be, in fact, um, really beyond dispute, right? Or are assumed to not even be cultural categories so much as they are assumed to be biological, uh, biological categories. Uh, an obvious one that falls in that category is um, the categories associated with sex. Biological, as it's often called, biological sex, right? Um, versus gender, which is more often understood to be a cultural elaboration of biological sex, right? And you'll still find that distinction. Sex is biology, gender is culture. Um, anthropologists addressing these issues actually would suggest that sex is also a cultural category, right? 
um, that these are identities that certainly have a foot in biological variation, but that the way we assign them to people and the way we understand them in the world has a lot more to do with a particular cultural history than what nature or biology hands us, right? Um, and we can see that just in the very fact that indeed, even biologically speaking, um, there are far more than two sexes out there, right? There's actually much more of a continuum. Um, often those, um, that range of variations is, um, is sort of forced into a binary. Um, but in fact, the, the biology of it is way more complicated than often is captured by our cultural categories, right? Um, gender is at least as complex, right? There's often an understanding that gender is cultural, but even that understanding does not always capture the variability of gender expression, gender categories um, across the world. So you'll see a lot of examples um, of, um, you know, acts of gender expression and categories in particular cultural worlds, some of which do map onto categories we might find in the U.S. and some that do not. Um, so I think we want to continue to interrogate the difference between sex and gender, right? And in so doing, question whether what we think sex is and maybe what we think gender is, um, is uh, borne out by what we see in the world or whether we're projecting um, a set of particularly sort of Western cultural assumptions onto a much more complex array of um, expressions in by people and in cultural contexts around the world. Um, likewise, the relationship between gender and sexuality is, um, is complex and something we'll talk about here uh, and something that doesn't always map easily um, onto some of our language um, and some of our assumptions about people's lives. Um, Indeed, as we'll talk about when we get into the review articles, this is one of the areas that has been the hardest for scholars to theorize, right? Um, I think we understand gender and sexuality to be distinct from one another, and yet they absolutely inform and maybe even constitute one another. Um, so figuring out both how to capture all the variation we see across the world in these areas and to theorize it in a way that helps us understand better um, the world um, is, again, one of the challenges and, and one of the main areas of what we'll see anthropologists doing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so understanding gender and sexuality across cultures is absolutely one of the key things that anthropologists in these areas are doing. Um, and so part of it is simply uh, sort of documenting all that variability, but always that documentation is not an end in itself. It's contributing to a broader understanding of, again, all the things that ties together as humans and how we can understand that variability, right? So it's both about the specificity of cultural variability and about striving for a broad understanding of what it is to be human. A lot of that, as I've mentioned, is entails confronting dualisms right, particularly Western cultural dualisms, which have often been the lens through which these issues are assessed and described. So those dualisms include things like male versus female, heterosexual versus homosexual, and even mind versus body, which we'll talk about in a bit when we talk about the Shelford Hughes and Locke um, article. Um, so th there's, we should not take for granted that those dualisms are the way the world is. But we should take seriously that those are powerful concepts. Um, so what we're going to do then is try to understand where those dualisms come from and, again, unpack or challenge them to try to understand how they operate in the world. Um, the other piece of what we're doing in this course is really the anthropology of the body, which um, is broader than thinking about gender and sexuality. It, it also absolutely is is intersecting with gender and sexuality, um, but the anthropology of the body also goes to things like medical anthropology, including, as you saw in one of um, the articles you read. Uh, another way to talk about this is the concept of embodiment, right? So when we talk about the anthropology of the body, we're really talking about um, you know, what, it, what is the role and meaning of the body in cultural worlds? What, did it, what is it 
how can we think about and talk about what it is to live in your body, right? Given that your bodily form is how you move through the world, right? Um, the physicality of embodiment is really important in terms of how we actually do culture. So that's where this attention to the body comes in, right? Um, so in this course, as we think about gender and sexuality, we'll also be looking at that literature and those examples that talk about the role of the body in these things, right? So in other words, there's a few parts here. One is um, understanding the body as sort of the site of experience and practice, right? Um, we encounter the world through our bodies, right? Like in our embodied form, right? We're not just a bunch of sort of minds conceptualizing and theorizing. Um, we are um, grounded in a sort of a uh, physicality. And that becomes a really important part of how we do things and experience things in the world, right? So the body as the site of experience. Um, also bodies as symbolic, right? I talked previously about how um, culture is symbolic or that humans sort of traffic in symbols. And bodies often play a distinct sort of symbolic role. Um, so the relationship, for example, between individual bodies and social bodies, right? Um, where um, social bodies are often understood or talked about almost as physical bodies, and your your individual physical body is often um, sort of either part of a social body or becomes one of the sites of contested debates about what the shape of a social body should be. Um, likewise, because bodies are often naturalized, and what I mean is that there's that sense in which um, we often default to the idea that the body is biology, not culture. Um, that also makes it sort of a contested space, right? Um, our individual physical bodies are enmeshed in a global political economy, right? Um, and all those sort of um, political forces um, at national and international levels also sort of directly connect to our bodily experiences, right? Um, so those are some of the key sort of theoretical questions around the anthropology of the body, particularly as they intersect with studies of gender and sexuality that I think are, again, part of this sort of baseline. This slide is sort of baseline things that um, are going to be important as we move as we move forward. Okay, so what I want to do now is actually get to the four articles that you read. Um, I said before that these are review articles. Um, so as you saw, they have a sort of like a certain vibe to them. They can seem a little dry sometimes. I think some of these four things you read are, some are a little bit drier than others. Um, but I think it's still important to read them because they are precisely about orient, orienting you to the scholarship in these areas. Um, so it's a way to sort of um, jump in to a subject that you may not be familiar with without having to read all 800 things that they cited, right? So the idea is that you can read one of these review articles and it's it's somebody who's really knowledgeable in that field has sort of crunched a ton of the scholarship into one article to say, look, here's the main points, here are the big themes, here's what you need to know about the scholarship in this area in the last 20 years, right? So it's a way to sort of... Um, to um, jumpstart your understanding of an area of scholarship is by reading these review articles. So that's why I had you read these as a way to sort of get us into the conversation fairly quickly to ramp up our knowledge so we can then get more into the details um, after we move beyond unit one, okay? All right, so I had you read four. Um, one focusing mainly on feminist anthropology one focusing on the anthropology of masculinity or men and masculinity, one focusing on queer anthropology, and one focusing on the anthropology of the body, right? Um, the first three are, are quite recent. They're fairly recent. The one about the body is an older article, but it just does such a great job, I think, of providing really useful theoretical tools for thinking about the body that, and it's a kind of a classic, so I kept it in there, and I think it's still useful. So the Mahmoud article, um, is reviewing feminist anthropology, recent feminist anthropology, 
Um, and you know, what I, what I'm going to talk about is what I think are some of the most important things that, that Mahmoud points out. Um, and that I think can help us remain critical thinkers and readers um, as we read uh, examples of ethnographies that either fall into the category of feminist anthropology or don't, right? Um, so this article is really kind of recognizing the contributions of this sub-subfield called feminist anthropology. Um, as Mahmoud points out, the idea or the, the sort of designation of feminist anthropology as a thing, as an area, um, has a fairly deep history, right? Since the 1970s, um, uh, anthropologists have been identifying themselves as working within the area of feminist anthropology. Um, and there's an association of feminist anthropology that's part of the major anthropology institution, professional organization, that publishes a journal. So again, this is a sort of institutionalized area of research. Um, and some of the things that feminist anthropologists have been talking about for a long time, since the 1970s, have been really important and even transformative to the discipline of cultural anthropology, right? And Mahmoud notes those, right? Um, one of them is the idea of reflexivity. Um, this is something you will see in practice as much as you'll hear people talk about in the stuff that we read for the course. The idea with reflexivity is interrogating the role and particularly the subject position of the anthropologist themselves in the context of the field work that they do, right? So what that means is recognizing, given that, given how anthropologists do their work, right? I already described that anthropologists do research through the practice of field work. So that means basically going to um, a community and interacting with the people there, right? And asking them questions and hanging around and observing things and all of that, right? But by definition, you are not just um, like a fly in the wall or a disembodied uh, observer, right? Behind a screen or something. You're a human being going into a social world and engaging with other human beings. So in fact, the, the, the social persona of the anthropologist has a lot to do with that exchange. So this idea of reflexivity is recognizing that the anthropologist is kind of part of the story of collecting information, right? The, the anthropo making the anthropologist not invisible in how we do the work and how we write about the work. So you'll see one of the ways you'll see reflexivity um, sort of um, created in or, or reflected in the stuff you read is that cultural anthropologists usually write from the first perspective, right? They say, I did this, right? I talked to someone and they told me this. And that's part of that reflexivity, right? Um, not removing the anthropologist from the frame of the research experience, but putting them in the frame and understanding that that's part of the nature of the, the information that was collected. And it depends on who, really who you are, right? People are responding to you as a human that they are sort of assessing in certain ways, right? You're not just a neutral um, person. You are a person, either a person from that place or a person from somewhere else. Um, often your gender as an anthropologist influences how people respond to you. Um, or what they think about you. All of those things are part of that um, fieldwork experience and they're therefore part of the work that we do. So reflexivity says, well, let's make that transparent and have that be part of how we actually discuss the work. Um, another, again, key contribution of feminist anthropology for decades that's still really important is a critique of um, what's often assumed to be scientific objectivity, right? So feminist anthropologists have long suggested that objectivity is not really objective, A, and may not necessarily be the only or the best way to collect information about the world, right? Um, that all knowledge is situated, right? There's no such thing as a neutral process of collecting or creating, of collecting information or creating knowledge, that there's all kinds of cultural elements that get smuggled into that process. So, um, so that critique, um, again, has been a really important one and that's become really part of cultural anthropology, even as it emerged initially out of feminist anthropology. 
Despite these long-standing contributions and the importance for the overall field of cultural anthropology, um, as Mahmoud points out, there is still a degree to which feminist anthropology is marginalized or provincialized. What I mean by provincialized is um, it, 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 it is still sometimes the assumption that feminist anthropology is, you know, the study of women, right? Or that it is only about things directly connect to subjects of gender. Um, instead, Mahmoud encourages us to take feminist anthropology more seriously as a broader analytical framework that can be applied to lots of different things. So the way she talks about this is um, encourages, encouraging us to embrace feminist anthropology as what she calls a traveling theory. The idea there is that feminist anthropology is a theoretical lens that can be applied to a whole range of subjects and issues. It's not just um, useful for looking at topics that are narrowly defined as being about gender or sexuality, right? Um, instead, it's a sort of a critical approach to all the things that anthropologists study. Uh, Mahmoud goes on to talk about some of the more recent contributions of feminist anthropology, um, some of which, again, overlap with those long-standing contributions. Um, and again, many of which we'll talk about in this course. Um, I also, just as a sort of aside, um, I hope you notice, too, as you're reading these four review articles, that they are in conversation with one another, right? So there's overlap and even... Some of the authors are referencing some of the other authors that you're reading. Um, and that um, a bunch of the authors that are mentioned in these review articles are on the syllabus and they're things we're going to read. Okay. So again, part of, uh, you know, another reason for having you read these um, review articles is to situate the things you're going to read later on. All right. So what are those key areas of um sort of focus and contribution in recent years from feminist anthropology. Um, the first is the anthropology of science and medicine. We'll have a whole unit on this. Um, so this is a critique of um, scientific literature and biomedical practice, particularly that reinforce binaries around sex, gender, and sexuality. Um, so um, again, unpacking the ways in which science and medicine have often be fr been framed as neutral um, or acultural in their approach to bodies and persons, and instead recognizing the degree to which there's a cultural context of which science and medicine are also a part, and that some of the things that get reproduced in scientific and medical approaches reinforce those cultural narratives. Um, another piece of the anthropology of science and medicine is really um, looking critically at, at ideas and practices associated with reproduction. Um, so both expectations around reproduction and things like the use of reproductive technologies, right? Um, so, um, so those are some of the, again, areas in the anthropology of science and medicine most associated with feminist anthropology. Um, again, in keeping with this idea that feminist anthropology is a traveling theory, um, feminist anthropologists have also contributed to areas outside of the anthropology of gender, right? So, for example, political anthropology. Um, the fact is that gender and sexuality are often important in, um, in politics, right? In governmental politics, in nation building, right? Um, ideas about, for example, women's roles or families often get put forward when politicians are um, trying to assert what the identity of a particular nation is or should be, right? We see that the world over. Um, so those kinds of that intersection between politics, both governance and political discourse and gender and sexuality, another key, key area for feminist anthropology. Um, also critiques of militarism and imperialism, right? So geopolitics, global politics have gendered components, right? Um, and this is an area for anthropologists to be involved as well. Um, likewise, economic anthropology. Um, and this includes um, critiques of sort of global economic systems like colonialism and capitalism and the ways they, again, reinforce um, 
ideas about gender and sexuality and or um, variably affect people of different genders or sexualities. All of this is stuff that's, um, that's part of what feminist anthropology does. Um, part of that economic anthropology area is also looking at the commodification of people, another area that we'll talk about in this course. So that includes things like sex work and trafficking, but also commo the commodification of body and body parts, right? Um, something that's increasingly part of advanced capitalism. So another area for feminist anthropology. And then the final area that Mahmoud talks about, and indeed she references this book on the right here, which is called Women Writing Culture, is the important role that feminist anthropologists have played in um, advancing ethnographic writing, right? I, when I, we were talking earlier in the lecture about cultural anthropology and the hallmarks of cultural anthropology, one of the things I mentioned is the distinctive approach to writing. Um, so those ethnographies we, re we, we create and that reflexive approach. Um, so feminist anthropologists have, uh, anthropologists have been especially attuned to the importance of how we write and what we write in the literature that we produce as anthropologists. So that includes both understanding the power of storytelling particularly when we're working with marginalized populations of people, right? Um, providing spaces for people to give voice to their own experiences is a really empower, a really important po uh, political act um, and is often part of the writing practices of feminist anthropologists. Um, Autoethnography is also part of that, which is a practice of sort of interrogating your own personal history and embedding that in a broader piece of ethnographic writing. Um, some um, anthropologists have also pioneered sort of connecting or, or overlapping um, fiction writing with ethnographic writing. Um, and in all of this, I think feminist anthropologists have been especially um, cognizant of the importance of the language that we use, both in terms of things like, in, like evoking the sensory experience of being in a certain place, right? So in other words, lively prose is important, right, as a part of our scholarly output, but also a sensitivity to our use of language and understanding that the terms we use and the concepts that we invoke um, are powerful and we need to be um, careful and diligent and in how we decide which words to use and which words not to use. So all of that, again, under the heading of contributions by feminist anthropologists. Okay, the second article is Gutmann's article about the anthropology of men and masculinities. Um, and Gutmann, um, and I'm sure by now you've seen his name come up multiple times. Um, he's an important anthropologist of this area. Um, this is his, his first book that really kind of um, brought him to the forefront of study of this set of topics that he wrote, The Meanings of Macho, um, which is about masculinity in Mexico City. Um, so he's a really obvious choice to write this review article since he's one of those sort of key people in the area of the anthropology of men and masculinities, um, which, as he points out, has really been something that's seen huge growth in like the last 20 years, right? Um, was much less of a an explicit topic for anthropology before 2000, and now we see sort of a lot of literature coming out. Um, and so a lot of what the anthropology of men and masculinities is about is really what he calls marking the unmarked. This, this idea of categories being marked or unmarked is a useful tool. And, and I think probably many of you have sort of encountered it somewhere in a course, in a social science course. But the idea is um, dominant categories or dominant identities often go unmarked. They are kind of the assumed default position. So the marked categories, the ones that are sort of called out, are the, the less dominant categories, right? Um, so categories like male or in terms of race, white, are often the unmarked categories, right? They just are. Um, and it's sort of everybody else that is sort of labeled or identified, right? So what 
Gutmann says then is the project of the anthropology of men and masculinities, given that the category man or the identity of masculinity are those sort of unmarked categories, is to mark those unmarked categories, to not take for granted that a man is man, right? Um, or masculinity is dominant, right? It, to not take it for granted, but to, again, uh, pay attention to it and really sort of interrogate what's going on there, right? So instead of it being a taken for granted category, asking questions like, what is a man, right? What constitutes a man? Not letting it be the assumed default, right? Um, so, um, so, so this is sort of the project of the anthropology of men and masculinities. As he points out, a lot of this work has, has come out of, um, queer and feminist studies, both more broadly at queer anthropology and feminist anthropology more particularly. So this is also work that is not just specific to cultural anthropology, just as, you know, feminist anthropology is just one piece of feminist scholarship that, um, you know, has a long history outside of the field of anthropology. Um, so, so a lot of this work is coming out of those more specific areas, but also, as he said, again, it's just emerging as, as more of an area for scholarship in anthropology. Okay, so what are then the key areas in this area, right? So I'm going to do something sort of parallel to what I did for feminist anthropology. Um, what are the scholars working on men and masculinities focusing on? What are they highlighting? Um, certainly sexuality is, is a key area. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that anthropologists of men and masculinities are studying men's sexuality. Um, there's a long history um, that comes out of feminist and queer anthropology um, of looking particularly at HIV AIDS um, and um, really reproductive and sexual health more generally as they inform um, sort of ideas about sexualities and gender and all of those kinds of things. Um, certainly throughout the AIDS crisis in the United States and elsewhere, that has been one of the lenses on that particular health set of health issues. Um, also things like sex work and sex tourism, again, we'll talk a little bit about that later in the course, and how those kinds of commodified sex um, also go to all kinds of ideas about sexuality, right, and how people define or categorize different sexualities. Um, because this is the anthropology of men, um, the work on sexuality here is really focusing on interrogating male sexuality. And again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, not taking for granted what makes male sexuality is or looks like. Um, and instead looking more historically and culturally at all the huge variable range of, of male sexualities. Um, and understanding also male sexuality to be more fluid um, than it may be assumed to be. Um, the third area in the study of sexuality in this sort of um, sub subfield is um, looking at sexualities beyond binaries um, and genders beyond binaries. Um, so anthropologists have long been pioneers in looking at what is often called third genders. That is um, cultural contexts in which there are more than two sort of commonly recognized gender categories or gender identities. Um, and instead of using that sort of term or that idea of adding a third category, instead um, broadening our perspective to, to that of non-binary. So both recognizing people who identify as non-binary as part of that, but also um, trying not to divide our understanding of gender and sexuality into categories in quite that same way and thinking more about the fluidity of continua, where people locate themselves in, in a lot more positionalities than just two or even three. So, um, so a lot of this work on male sexuality also looks for all that fluidity and all of those sort of possibilities that are actually out there. Um, a second area for anthropology of men and masculinities is the study of the military. Yeah. Sorry, Siri. Um, so both military life and then militarization more generally, right? Like in, in political contexts. So this includes things like the study of, um, soldiers and soldiers' lives, um, experiences of warfare, um, and other kinds of related issues. 
Um, and the relationship between how um, things like war and, mis and masculinity are conceptualized, right? Particularly in societies where, um, you know, men going to war is part, or part of or one of the markers of what it means, quote, to be a man, right? So thinking about, again, how those things play out. Uh, violence is another one of the subjects, um, and again, violence is another topic on our agenda for this semester. Um, and again, in this, you know, from what Gutman's talking about, really the relationship between violence and, and ideas about manliness, um, and the sort of assumed relationship between masculinity and violence. Um, and, you know, again, we need to recognize both that um, violence occurs um, and that there are men involved in violence, right? Um, but also that there's all kinds of assumptions that essentialize what it means to be a man in terms of some kind of impulse for violence. In some contexts, it's almost portrayed as being sort of part of the nature of men to be violent, right? So again, thinking about interrogating, sort of critically looking at those kinds of narratives, understanding where they come from, um, and understanding, you know, what, if anything, we should be doing about that kind of narrative and those kinds of experiences. Um, and then a whole host of other things that he sort of runs through. Um, so how masculinity intersects with things like work or sports or religion, race and nationalism, questions about fathering migration. So I think, you know, one of his points is that this is really a burgeoning, emerging area of research within cultural anthropology. There's a real uptick in the number of, of anthropologists working specifically in men and masculinity. So it's sort of um, an exciting area, again, particularly as it is marking the unmarked in a way that has not been done as much before these last 20 years. All right. So the other thing that Gutman offers is that there are some theoretical contributions coming out of the anthropology of men and masculinities that are important for anthropology more generally. Um, so the first is, as he noted, there's an increase in work in men and, uh, on men and, man, and masculinities outside of the US, which is important for, again, understanding that variability. Um, and he cautions that um, one of the things that the anthropology of men has offered is um, the importance of not trying to apply theories um, relevant to the global north, right, or to the United States and Western Europe, to experiences in the global south, right? And that means both making more space for scholars from the global south to talk about these issues um, and understanding that we may need new theoretical constructs to really um, be able to address the full range of variability, right? So part of it is catching up with not having studied these issues everywhere in the world um, and making sure that we don't um, sort of front load um, some Western centric theories without leaving space for some other ideas to emerge. Um, a second area that he mentions is that this um, subfield has been important in challenging the concept of hegemonic masculinity. What he means here is that the anthropology of men is really challenging the notion that masculinity is a thing, right? Like that there is a, co a coherent entity that is masculinity. So instead, he's saying this is not an a priori concept, right? This is not a thing that exists in the world and our job is just to try to study it, but it's instead something that is produced, right? This is a cultural construction that emerges out of various social, economic, political, etc. dynamics, right? So if we want to understand what masculinity is, we need to understand its creation, right? Sort of in any place and time, not assume that it's some kind of primordial, primordial um, uh, concept that just was kind of there from the beginning, right? Um, so part of this, what this means is moving beyond thinking of masculinity as an identity and looking more to sort of the historical context of its creation and the material um, sort of elements of its construction, right? So how masculinity is produced and what the effects of its production are. And that certainly includes specifically in regards to gender and sexuality, but more, more broadly, right? So we alluded in the previous slide to 
you know, the intersection of gender and sexuality and politics, um, global politics, warfare, all of those things. So understanding the production of masculinity can also help us understand things like the political relationships between countries, right, or the Cold War, um, or any of these things, right? So, um, so again, this is an area of theoretical contribution from the anthropology of men. So what we're talking about here really is sort of um, moving beyond some of these um, um, assumptions about categories and instead um, moving into a more sort of critical stance. I think that's really the main point that Gutmann is trying to suggest here. Um, this suggestion of adopting a broader theoretical framework is really parallel to what we'll see from the next article we're going to talk about, the bolster. Um, and it's having a more overarching sort of approach to a bunch of interrelated issues, as opposed to trying to, as he says, enumerate um, strategies or literatures to sort of each subgroup within a broader area. So instead of having an anthropology of men and masculinities and then an anthropology of uh, gender or feminist anthropology, um, instead thinking about studies that might encompass um, the experiences of men, women, and non-binary people, right? So understanding all of that to be interconnected um, as a new sort of theoretical strategy. So this is something that he um, suggests is a contribution of the emerging anthropology of men and masculinities and something that's kind of a goal to work toward. So um, the next article is by Ballstorff, um, and this is the review of queer anthropology. Um, and he, again, like the other authors, uh, sort of provides um, a review of the areas of focus, right? Some of the major things that um, recent publications in the area of queer anthropology have contributed. And then also some sort of theoretical points. So let's start with that. Um, Bolstorff, as I'm sure you've noticed, is um, another important anthropologist who gets cited a lot um, in discussions of these areas. Um, this is one of his books here on the right. Um, he did field work in Indonesia um, and, and working with um, lay and, uh, uh, gay and lesbian Indonesians and really thinking about how LGBTQ um, categories and identities are um, sort of put forward in Indonesia, which is uh, conversant with, but not the same as the way those identities and categories circulate in the United States. So, um, so he's, again, an anthropologist, longstanding um, investment in this area of anthropology. So in terms of those areas of focus, um, certainly there's a longstanding um, interest in LGBT categories and um, experiences, right? So again, both how things are um, sort of divided up in different societies and how individuals experience their lives, um, given those categories and, and other things. Um, uh, there's also a focus on um, women's experiences, particularly women's sexualities, um, and particularly non-normative sexualities. Um, so um, there's lots of ways in which that work has been done, um, also focused on this idea of embodiment, um, as I've already just talked about a bit, and questions of female agency, desire, and community. Um, just as we discussed for Gutmann, Bolstorff is also talking about the intersection of this um, set of subjects with politics and economics. Um, so indeed, um, we really can't separate uh, gender and sexuality from broader issues in the world around politics and economics. So part of that is there's been an increase in work on um, lesbian and gay people's experiences, um, people who live outside of the U.S., right? So just a kind of increasing our regional literatures of understanding um, sort of what people experience. Um, the commodification of sex is also, again, one of those themes we've seen across all of these areas. Um, so that's another piece of the work, uh, current work in queer anthropology. And then, um, again, very similar to what I'm talking about, uh, what we've talked about in the other review articles, um, the intersection of queer anthropology and 
um, geopolitics, nation building, those kinds of things. We find that it is often the case that national governments make use of a sort of normative heterosexuality in asserting the identity of the nation, right? So again, those all kinds of assumptions about gender and sexuality are um, part of the narrative.